Welcome to Deloitte's Debrief's Tax webcast series in Asia Pacific. Our webcast today is from our Corporate Income Tax series and is titled The Future is Now, Global Economy. My name is Jacques van Rijn. I'm an IT advisory tax partner based here in Australia. I have the pleasure of hosting today's webcast. I have three speakers with me today, June Sawada, Kong Ping Cha, and Aaron Wang. June is a tax partner based in Deloitte, Japan. Kong Ping is a tax partner based in Deloitte, Singapore. And Aaron is a tax partner based in Deloitte, China. You may access our bios on the left side of the screen. Before I introduce the agenda for today's webcast, I'd like to take a moment to highlight some of the features of our webcast console. First, all users are on listen only mode. If you have any content related questions, you can submit them at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom right of the screen. And we'll do our best to respond at the end of the presentation if time allows. Second, all PC users can maximize or minimize each box at your convenience during the webcast. You may also explore the icons at the bottom of the screen. If you want to download today's slides and related publications, please go to the Downloads and Links box. On the other hand, mobile device users can view the slides and answer the survey on the screen. Thirdly, if you require an attendance record for this event, you will receive an automated email with CPE certificate after watching for 50 minutes. So again, welcome. Thank you for attending our session today. If we could move to the next slide, please, Perry. So today we are talking about an uh, in, intangibles driven global economy, and we want to cover a few topics for you. So firstly, what we'll do is we'll hear from our integrated specialist IP advisory partners that sit in transfer pricing about the evolving Asia Pacific intangibles landscape. We will discuss what good compliance looks like. And we'll also hopefully have enough time to discuss areas of contention for tax authorities. And if time allows, uh, we will discuss some questions and answer. So, Let's move on to today's topic. Some of you may have attended previous debriefs on intangibles and heard me talk about the post COVID era. But if we think about the tax landscape, the digital economy has featured heavily during the BEPS era already. Many international tax changes, BEPS were justified because of the digital economy and the digital economy challenged the traditional tax rules. And then we had COVID. And COVID not only challenged these rules, but has challenged the way we work, play and live. COVID also accelerated technological innovation. Think about your life today versus before COVID. Remote working and the way that we connect and we were talking earlier this afternoon about Zoom and the use of online platforms to connect. A lot of them did not exist before COVID. So COVID has had a major impact on the speed of change. Think about all the different systems and exist in your business today that did not exist before COVID and how your business has evolved over this time. How have come at companies adopted to remote working and specifically workforce challenges? So when we look at the global economy, I'd say the post COVID and whether we are post COVID or not, but for use of a description, the post-COVID global economy is driven and will be driven by new innovative business models, 
and it will be underpinned by proliferation of technology and innovation. The speed of change that we're seeing now is unprecedented. But these new business models, which are mostly not people driven, they are technology are changing the global tax landscape and is a challenge for our tax fraternity. And we need to adapt to new ways of allocating and taxing profits. So in this regard, if we think about this global focus on intangibles by businesses, it's not surprising that tax authorities are also stepping up the way that they are looking at the use of technology and, and challenging traditional taxation models. But you may think, well, why is this so important? We're just living in a tax world. We react to what tax authorities do. So let me just set a bit of a scene about why this has become so important. The world has always been innovating. But there's been a quantum shift in the value proposition from a tangible to an intangibles world. If we look at something like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ um, listed companies, 84% of the market capitalization of S&P 500 companies now consist of intangibles and 95% of the market value of the NASDAQ. Data is now the world's most valuable asset, no longer oil. And global GDP by the end of 2022 will be driven by 60% by the digital economy. And we see in growth across every industry. So it's industry agnostic. So if we think about this, we see all these challenges happening. But let's think about our backyard, Asia Pacific. So if we move to the next slide, please. What I'd like to illustrate here is the pace of change in our um, region. So if we look at this slide we, and we think about the, the pace of change and we consider the impact of digital innovation relative to other patents, we've seen a 718% growth in artificial intelligence. 699% growth in data, 122 in cloud computing, 109% autonomous systems. Internet of Things is the only one that's gone backwards and digital technologies have grown by 172%. Now, if we think about the share of the Asia Pacific economy and we just look at these three countries specifically, right? In the late 19 say 85 to 90, Japan was already representing 51% of the global patent technology landscape. In 2005, Republic of Korea was around 15%. And then around 2020, China was around 14%. But if you look at the trend lines, all of them were trending upwards. And Japan has always been known as a technology powerhouse. But one of the surprising statistics was China. So before we go to our first polling question, I'd like to bring up uh, other presenters into this today. So Aaron, what is your take on China's position as shown by the chart relative to the other countries? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, I, I think the chart uh, fairly reflects where China is currently standing. Uh, apparently, Japan and Korea uh, had enormous advantages in talents and the capital over China in those earlier years. And, and China was only entering a fast lane, I think, after 2010. Uh, however, I'd like to just uh, call out the provenance of uh, China's advance in areas of uh, big data, AI, and the cloud computing. All these aspects are catalyzed in recent years by the government's strategy and a massive investment, uh, whether it's uh, industry 4.0 that enables highly customized production or cloud computing 
being led by we call BAT, that is Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And further, if we look at intangible assets in the wider sense, I think the gap that China falls behind Japan and Korea may not be um, that big. Uh, a common observation is China is in the front, front running group for its highly developed electronic payment infrastructure and the digitized B2C market. A big chunk of China's investment and the intangible assets accordingly uh, con concentrate on areas such as uh, algorithms, uh, digital marketing, consumer data, and the cloud computing. Uh, back to you, Zach. Thank you, very interesting. So ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to bring you into the webcast now. So we are gonna start with our first polling question and uh, we ask you to participate uh, in this polling question. So the first question we'd like to ask you today is who in your company is the ultimate custodian of the intangible assets? So the answers, uh, options available, there's no custodian, I'm not sure. If we assume it to be the company directors, it may be the R&D manager, it may be legal or tax and finance. And we ask you to please vote. Uh, and while we wait for the results, so if you keep on voting, um, Aaron, just linking to the previous one and now this question, from your experience, uh, who generally deals with these intangibles at your clients? Um, I think uh, uh, in my experience, uh, the answers uh, may vary uh, by industries um, because most of my clients are subsidiaries of uh, multinational companies rather than headquarters. Um, so I observe uh, the main function of the subsidiary, uh, whether it's manufacturing or distribution, may also uh, be a factor bearing relevance to the answer. In general, I would say tax teams are more sensitive than other departments of the organization. And normally uh, tax teams are closely involved uh, in addition to legal teams. Uh, back to you, Jack. Thank you. Yeah, so it's uh, interesting that um, it seems to be across the spectrum. So um, we're just waiting to see if our polling results come up. Um, we're just waiting for a second. But my observation is that um, just on this question is that, it, again, as you've mentioned, the changes from country to co uh, company to company. In some instance, historically, the let's say registrable uh, intellectual property. Uh, was the custodian of the legal team. Uh, but with the changes under the tax definitions, I think there's a swing to that, and we'll talk about that a bit later. So um, just seeing if the results will come up. If they don't, we'll just move on. Okay, so we may uh, don't see the results coming up, Perry. So let's uh, maybe move on to the next slides, and we can always talk about the results a bit later. So from that perspective, um, the question then arises is who's looking at your intangibles, right? And at the end of the day, the question is with this proliferation of intangibles, the question I'd like to ask the audience today to think about is we've moved from a tangible to an intangible world, but what has your company done to adapt and adopt new processes and policies? Do you understand how this applies to your company are you as the tax person or tax team um read into your intangibles but we heard the growth of intangibles in asia pacific now what we'd like to do now is hear from each of our presenters to get a bit of an idea of what is happening across the region so I'm going to now go back to our presenters and we'll hear what is happening in the region and how this is aligning with this global development. So firstly, I'd like to go to June. June, from a Japanese perspective, um, could you share with us some thoughts what's happening in Japan around intangibles, please? Uh, sure, Jack. Um, I would like to present some topics, uh, maybe from a macro perspective to tax specific topics. Um, First of all, Japan has announced its intellectual property promotion plan for FY22, uh, focusing on eight areas. 
and uh, this includes strengthening of ecosystem between startups and universities, uh, improvement of investment and utilization of IP, um, improvement in the development and use of digital contents, and reboot of cool Japan in the post-COVID area. Uh, in December 2019, as part of the fiscal 2020 tax reform, uh, the government announced an open innovation tax incentive that allows companies to deduct from their taxable income 25% of share purchase amounts in startups. Uh, and this would likely to continue until uh, March 31, 2024. Um, according to uh, METI, uh, open innovation tax incentives have been given to 77 companies in 122 cases so far. Um, but these are not specifically to companies in the technology and software sectors. So you can understand how much interest this uh, uh, incentive is, 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 is drawing from the, uh, from the audience. Now, subsequent to the MTA's tax reform, uh, which went into effect for fiscal years starting April 1, 2020, uh, the uh, in interpretive uh, circulars and administrative guidelines were amended to clarify the definition of intangible assets uh, for tax purpose and TP purpose, uh, and also to include the uh, DCF uh, method as a new transfer processing methodology uh, for testing intangibles, and to introduce the HTVI concept. And you know, these changes are really in line uh, with the BEPS and, and OECD transfer processing guidelines. Um, the lockdown uh, due to COVID-19 reduced numbers of audit cases dramatically. However, recently, uh, the NTA uh, is restarting audits, uh, particularly focusing on intercompany transactions. Um, and of course, these includes intangibles uh, and also financial transactions. So these two are the current focus of the NTA. Um, we see statistics show that even though the number of audit cases uh, went down during COVID, uh, the assessment amount uh, actually did not drop. So. We can see how interested the NTA is on intercompany transactions and, and transfer pricing. Um, so uh, back to you, Jack. Thank you, Jun. So um, what we would now like to do is it's really interesting to hear how Japan's moved. Let's um, go to Aaron. Aaron, can you take us through how the changes in um, China, please? Yeah, sure. Um, China has been upholding a policy of uh, incentivizing innovation and R&D for a long time. Uh, after new income tax law came into effect in 2008, uh, many preferential tax treatments were scrapped. But R&D, the incentives around R&D stayed and continued as uh, one area uh, where tax planning ideas could be implemented. Um, and developing intangible assets in China can be uh, very rewarding uh, from a tax perspective, uh, in addition to uh, potential fiscal and local government subsidies. Um, taxpayers' effective income tax rate can be reduced to uh, lower than 15% uh, with a double count on both a preferential tax rate and the super deduction of R&D costs. The precondition for any of uh, these favorable treatments um, is the core uh, R&D work of, of a taxpayer uh, generating intangible assets to be protected under local law uh, shall be performed in China. And, and by the way, uh, for us tax people, an ETR lower than 15% uh, for pillar two purpose uh, would apparently uh, mean uh, the uh, um, impact of pillar two uh, kicks in uh, when pillar two comes into effect. So um, I, I want to remind our audience, um, if you are considering uh, any tax planning uh, through IP development in China, I suggest uh, potential impacts of uh, pillar two should be um, evaluated in advance. Coming back to the tax incentives uh, from core R&D 
I discussed earlier, um, I want to call out uh, the STA is more conscious than ever of the value brought by localization of uh, taxpayers' uh, global technologies in China. And the value of data accumulated uh, through local application or exploitation of uh, uh, global IP. Uh, there has been a clear view from them um, that a business model or intangible assets uh, would only realize uh, their value and the potential in the right hands. Specifically, uh, the STA is uh, increasingly looking into how intangible assets uh, in a wider economic sense and how the uh, IPs are generated by local entities uh, in connection with a review of the profile and the capabilities of local teams within the global organization. Uh, back to you, Jack. Thanks, Aaron. Very, very interesting. Um, and uh, as we move on in a, a, a few minutes, we'll talk about the role of local development. But let's hear from uh, Kong Ping. Uh, from a, this, a Singapore perspective, what is uh, the changing landscape and how is that developing, please? Yeah, so with uh, regards to Singapore, over the years, uh, we have gradually picked up the individual alphabets in the Denby chain. And to provide some context, uh, Singapore is a fairly late entrant into the R&D space and only began to you know, pour resources into this area in the early 90s by trying to build up a base of scientists and engineers. So obviously, the skill sets will vary between each um, alphabet, and it takes time to build up uh, capabilities in each of the areas. Uh, presently, IP just moved to Singapore as part of a commercially driven uh, substance or principal structure. And the principal will exploit the IP either in the provision of a service or the manufacture of a product. And the revenue is likely subject to tax at a reduced uh, tax rate due to incentives. And uh, tax amortization is often claimed on the IP. It is um, not common to see taxpayers exploiting Singapore's patent box a regime which is called the IP Development Incentive or IDI. Um, the IDI was introduced post BEPS and it offers a five or 10% tax rate on qualifying royalty income. And I think it is fair to say that the uh, take up rate of this incentive is not particularly high. From a tax amortization perspective, um, the IRAS typically focuses on characterization and valuation. So for characterization, that's important because not IP will qualify for amortization in Singapore. Uh, and we're also seeing a lot of queries in the valuation space. And on this point, uh, the RRAS has a team of certified valuers. So queries in this space are very robust. Uh, we see a full spectrum of questions uh, ranging from the credentials of the valuer, the analysis around the business and, and the value drivers, and the valuation approach itself, the assumptions and the inputs in the chosen uh, valuation approach. So it's extremely comprehensive. Uh, and if we move to uh, the non uh, principal or or on licensing or on uh, licensing structures, the challenge is usually around whether a trade or business is being carried on in Singapore. So, for example, do we have at least uh, the protection or exploitation activities being uh, carried on in Singapore? So, for example, is there a person in Singapore that decides uh, which companies would the IP be licensed to? and whether the company decides on the legal actions to be taken pertaining um, to the IP. The last a couple of points are interlinked. So uh, post-pandemic and also uh, in part due to the geopolitical tensions, uh, businesses see the need to build a resilience in their value chain. And the mindset now is that uh, cost efficiencies without resilience just simply does not work. And as a result, we are beginning to see that Singapore is picking up more of the development and enhancement uh, activities. And uh, sometimes it is in conjunction with a broader shift of activities into Southeast Asia, such as uh, manufacturing. Uh, whether uh, Singapore or should I say businesses will, will exploit IP out of Singapore is generally a function of business needs. Uh, whether the uh, decision making is centralized or decentralized and whether there's a need to be closer to the markets. I'll just touch uh, briefly on the R&D benefits, uh, be it in the form of enhanced uh, deductions, incentives, grants, or subsidies. And what you get is generally a function of whether Singapore is the entrepreneur
number of risk taker. And uh, I think it's interesting to note that even if you set up only R&D service provided in Singapore, there may still be some incentives in the form of grants or subsidies to attract the R&D work to, to be done in a country in the hopes of knowledge transfer and building up the local workforce. And, and of course, uh, the OECD has also just issued a report on the impact of the global minimum tax rate on uh, incentives and the finding that tax incentives will be impacted, it, it will come as no uh, surprise. So pillar two is expected to have an impact on the amortization of IP that, that uh, might be a DTL recapture risk if the book and tax uh, lives are, are not in sync. And of course, there is also the effective tax rate risk if you were to take up uh, the R&D enhanced deductions. Uh, back to you, Jack. Thank you. So really interesting to hear from our three presenters on Japan, China, and Singapore. Um, really, in, uh, one of the key things that, that we um, hear is a big focus on the DEMPI uh, and specifically what that means, as well as a focus on the people function. So we're going to uh, deal with that after our second polling question. So again, we'd like to bring you into this webcast and ask the following polling question. So the question that we have today is, and we've spoken about um, the custodian, but in this question, for tax and transfer pricing purposes, organizations must identify intangible assets with specificity. How well has your organization identified its valuable intangible assets? And the options that you have is, we haven't done any discovery exercise, we are planning it or we haven't done anything up to date. Um, our register or discovery exercise, but it's currently um, not comprehensive. Current register of traditional intellectual property, so different to intangibles. We plan to update the register through a discovery exercise. And we have a comprehensive and current register identifying intangible assets with specificity. And we'll work through what this really means in the second part of this. So whilst we wait for the results, um, June, I'd like to come back to you. From a Japanese perspective, do you see companies identifying the intangible assets with specificity? Thank you, Jack. Um, I think although the uh, Japanese tax authorities have been traditionally taking a transaction by transaction approach, uh, when analyzing transfer pricing. Due to the updated Japanese uh, tax regulations followed by the change in the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, um, uh, I guess not only the tax examiners, but the Japanese uh, companies are now, now forced to capture uh, the, the broadly defined intangibles from tax and TP perspective. And, uh, you know, I think we have been quite used to testing some of the traditional intangibles, such as Patented, patented IPs and, and copyrights. However, we are still at the early stages in identifying and evaluating intangibles such as you know, new business models and, and uh, marketing IPs. And, and as part of um, the functions and assets and risk delineation, understanding how risk is really associated with the IP development and how it should be remunerated is becoming a, a true focus in Japan. Uh, back to you, Jack. Thank you. So let's uh, share the results with the audience. Um, so it's very interesting to see the results. So 25 uh, responses, about 34%. Uh, no discovery exercise has been undertaken. Is planned or to update the register, which is quite high. Um, and then 35% do have a current register of traditional intellectual property. And only 15% at the moment have a comprehensive and current range register identifying intangible assets. So if, uh, the, if we understand the data here, uh, quite a high percentage of companies have not identified the intangibles. And this aligns with uh, global research that was done that most big multinationals have not adopted the new intangible definition in this regard. So Let's, for a moment, just understand why we were asking this question and why is this relevant uh, 
to our audience and the discussion today. So let's move to the next slide, please, Perry. So we've heard from our presenters what is happening in some of the key jurisdictions across the region. The question is, why is that such a big issue for uh, tax practitioners um, across the region and, and maybe a CFO? Um, and why are we doing these sessions on intangibles? Well, for those that haven't heard this or attended this before, let's just uh, remind ourselves for a few moments about the changes that came uh, as a result of BEPS and specifically Action 8. So the OECD expanded its focus from intellectual property, which is more a legal definition, to a much broader intangibles definition. And the tax definition is broader than general accounting and general tax definitions. So anything that's not a tangible asset, that's not a financial instrument, that can be controlled and has value, could be a valuable intangible. But not all intangibles are valuable. So they may be an intangible, but they're not necessarily value, valuable. What is critical is that we need to be able to identify intangibles with specificity. We need to be able to categorize and catalog, catalog them to understand what they are and how they drive value in the company. What is a key change is that if we think about, about uh, IP structures, historically, IP structures were set up, say, in a lower tax jurisdiction where there was legal ownership and the additional profit generated from the intangibles would normally flow back to the legal owner. The legal ownership or the legal IP holding company may or may not have held a lot of substance. It would provide the financing, but generally it was just the legal owner. Now, under this new approach, those structures may only entitle the legal owner uh, to a basic return or a risk-free rate of return. And where the emphasis has changed is now we have a higher emphasis on where the significant people functions are being performed. So when Aaron was speaking about the focus of China and local value adding and R&D, this has been a focus in India and a lot of emerging economies where they were saying, well, all the work is done in our country. Yes, it's owned offshore, but we're adding the value. So a greater focus on development, enhancement, maintenance, protection, and exploitation. These are not new functions. They are just enhanced focus on them. But we are not only just focusing on the key functions that perform these intangible activities. We also now need to consider who manages and controls the associated risks. So if you go to chapter one, you can only allocate risk where there is control. And control can only be performed by people function. So what we are looking at is where are the DEMPI functions, where are the operational risks associated with the performance of those DEMPI functions, and they're not necessarily in the same place. And then the third test is who manages and controls the associated financing. So again, we look at the ability to manage and bear the financial risks associated with the performance of DEMPI. So if we try and allocate a financial risk to an entity, but it doesn't have the balance sheet to do that, well, then we cannot allocate the risk. If there's nobody to make a decision, we cannot allocate the risk. So we now have a broader definition of intangibles rather than intellectual property. We have to consider functions, assets, and risk in greater detail. We have to consider that in the light of the new DEMPI reference points. And then we need to reconsider the way we allocate profits based on ownership from a legal perspective and what I call economic ownership or where the significant people functions are performed. And they may not always be in the same jurisdiction. So what this means for us, ladies and gentlemen, is that traditional business models that we've seen over the last 30, 40 years being developed around intangibles or IP um, are being challenged. So what we now need to do is we've got to carefully consider where are the DEMPI functions being performed? Have you set up contract R&D functions? Where are the people? Where are the controls? Where's the funding coming from? 
how are decisions made? Who owns it legally? Because you could have a bifurcation between legal and economic ownership. And then we have to follow the six step approach of identifying the intangibles with specificity, looking at the illegal agreements, aligning substance and form, uh, ensuring consistency, critically to delineate transactions if they're interwoven, and then only do we get to pricing. So very, very detailed process. So what I'd like to do now is that I've set the scene. I want to go back to our audience and I'd like to ask each presenter to briefly give us a view on how the OECD's focus on DEMPI um, is looked at from their perspective. So let me start with Aaron. So Aaron, um, I've spoken about DEMPI, uh, I've explained the changes. Is this an area of focus for the STA in China? Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, indeed, um, the answer is yes. Uh, from a China perspective, um, the DEMPI framework has been formally recognized uh, in local reg transfer pricing regulation for a number of years now. So I'm not going to share details of the rule, but I want to highlight to our audience attention, STA not just uh, took in DEMPI, but also expanded um, based on DEMPI. Uh, we incorporating DEMPI into domestic -like regulation, uh, STA as another P after DEMPI. So in China, that becomes D-E-M-P-E-P. -E -E uh, the last P stands for promotion. How to understand the implications of a promotion? Um, I think by adding the concept of a promotion, we see STA doesn't uh, want people to forget or underplay the value of localization. Promotion is the way in STA's mind how China is adding value to MNC's global IP. As a result, no matter if it's a, in a, a TP audit context or for TP documentation purpose, um, the STA shows great interest in asking around the level of uh, local contributions. Uh, their questions can be, for example, uh, where an intangible does succeed in China, how that adds value back to global, and who within the global organization knows how to operate an IP to a success uh, when a foreign brand enters into China. Uh, when they ask, uh, be prepared, they already have answers uh, to their own questions, and uh, their questions are different than what we want to tell them. Um, for supply chain, um, China believes um, it has the largest and the fullest range of industrial uh, industrial chain globally. Uh, therefore, in STA's view, entry into China's supply chain itself uh, means benefits and potentials. And often, uh, uh, in such uh, occasion, a location-specific advantage is brought up for discussions. Uh, for that, that end, it can lead to quite interesting questions from STA. Uh, for example, does having a presence in China provide benefits to your organization uh, global network? Uh, is there actual return realized than elsewhere in the world because of uh, China's greater infrastructure? Um, if so, uh, is it attributable to the side that decided to enter into China Chinese market or the side that operates uh, the IP or business model in China. Um, if some of our audience find these questions uh, a bit general and want me to talk about uh, some industries, I want to say uh, for industries like uh, EV, uh, electronic vehicles, and uh, biotech, CTOs and senior technology people are increasingly working in China to be closer to the market or simply because these people are Chinese nationals. So uh, this gives rise to the discussion on China's position within the value chain, legal and economic ownership to intangible assets 
and the challenges to things like uh, uh, limited risk models. Uh, back to you, Zach. Thanks, Aaron. Just to, I just want to clarify something. I mean, you, you raise a really interesting point around location specific advantages and stuff, but um, we know the STA often emphasizes China as a unique market. Can you briefly give us uh, what does the statement mean with respect to intangibles? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, two of uh, STA's many derivative uh, viewpoints from that foothold are uh, first, uh, Chinese consumers are willing to pay a premium for foreign brands. Uh, we Chinese, we like uh, foreign brands. And second, it's easier for foreign intangibles or business models to succeed in China because uh, our market here has such a big demand for quality services and products uh, to be fulfilled. Um, I don't think uh, we have to agree 100% with them but you would find merits in their arguments. Uh, with, re with respect to intangibles in retail and the consumer industries, it's hardly possible to find another market around the globe that can experiment consumer data and the digital retail technologies like us, like China. Lots of brands are either already running their largest digital teams in China or are on the way to do so. Uh, after all, despite the fact uh, that Indian consumer class, uh, I, I Googled this statistics, uh, Indian consumer class growth is outpacing China. Uh, China has been and expected to remain the biggest consumer market in the near future. As a result, functions and risk of Chinese entities around e-commerce and associated intangibles could lead to uh, quite interesting discussions with STA or even disputes uh, with the tax authorities um, in terms of how China shall be recognized for the activities here. Uh, back to you, Jack. Thanks, Aaron. Definitely can't operate in the intangibles landscape in Asia Pacific without understanding the China landscape. So really important. Uh, Kong Ping, I'd like to bring you in here. So given Singapore is generally regarded as a gateway to Asia, how ha is the new OECD approach to intangibles impacting Singapore as a regional hub? And are you seeing changes to traditional business models? Yeah, um, so to first set the scene, um, the issues faced by Singapore will be very different from China and also indeed that of Japan you know, being the world's uh, second and third largest economies by GDP. And as everyone has mentioned, uh, China has a huge and unique uh, domestic market. And by comparison, uh, Singapore is a very small country with an almost non-existent uh, domestic market. Uh, so you can expect the, the uh, considerations in Singapore to be quite different. So Singapore has always uh, positioned itself as a hub location. And uh, in my mind, for a hub a location, would be the alignment of the business model and substance with tax strategy. So as a hub location where you expect uh, functions to be centralized, uh, it's gonna be important for companies to be able to justify the amount of profits that are being booked in Singapore. And uh, given that we expect uh, locations outside of Singapore to be earning a routine return, uh, this is really a roundabout way of saying that the challenges will also be coming from outside Singapore. and and. To that point, it's also interesting to note that the RIAS also conducts uh, transfer pricing audits of high margin taxpayers to obtain an understanding of their operations in Singapore. And this just feeds into the overall emphasis on maintaining uh, detailed documentation and having the right uh, people in Singapore being responsible for DEMPI uh, so that the RIAS is able to assist taxpayers when uh, cross-border disputes arise. And of course, on the other hand, if uh, you are conducting routine functions in Singapore, the IRAS may also scrutinize DMP, but uh, it should be fair to say that the IRAS is not known for being aggressive in this area. And uh, as long as the transaction is uh, properly documented and the conduct uh, matches the contract, the uh, characterization of an entity as routine or limited risk is uh, generally not a point of contention in Singapore. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. 
So, June, I want to bring you into this. Um, Japan has long been regarded as an innovative company, and the, the data we looked at right at the beginning showed that. In Australia, we've seen that the tax authorities are very much focused on foreign multinationals and, and the role that DENPI activities play that are performed locally. From a Japanese perspective, is there focus by the NTA on local value-adding activities? Uh, sure, Jack. Um, I think we can look at this from uh, maybe two different angles. And uh, first of all, for Japanese companies going outbound, um, some companies have been shifting its business model to having um, R&D functions closer to the market, uh, which allows uh, co-ownership of the developed IP uh, from both legal and economic standpoint. And this actually achieves uh, um, through arrangements such as uh, um, cost sharing, um, which may or may not be covered by an APA. And this approach not only assures alignment between DMP and uh, functions, assets, risk, and um, also remuneration um, for the developed IP, but also supports business issues such as uh, funding and, um, and possibly human resource issues. And of course, um, you know, risk is, exists uh, in this model from an IP management perspective, um, especially under uh, maybe geopolitically, geopolitically uh, unstable situations. And to, to your question, Jack, from a Japan inbound perspective, and NTA is clearly focusing on the importance of DEMPI, uh, locally performed, especially in relation to uh, contract R&D and sometimes local marketing functions. Um, for example, under a legally valid intercompany contract R&D agreement where the reporting lines is uh, well established and specific protocols are in place in proceeding with the local R&D activities, um, you know, if highly educated well experienced employees, local employees are involved in the R and D activities and the developed IP is used in the head office or other countries uh which generates you know true profits, uh the NTA will be expecting more than a cost plus markup. Um you know while while the NTA is open to concepts such as you know variable royalty rates, um which really appreciate the appreciates the contribution of valuable IP provided from uh, the overseas IP owner. Um, at the same time, the NTA will always consider whether Japan is receiving a fair share of the, con of the consolidated profits uh, through profit set methods based on DEMPs and uh, accurate delineation of uh, uh, functions, assets, and risk. Again, there is a strong focus on the people function, um, yet uh, the delineation of uh, the risk aspect associated with the development of IP is an area that needs to be further developed um, in Japan uh, in dealing with each of the issues that I mentioned. Um, back to you, Jack. Thank you. It's it's really interesting listening to all of our presenters today, ladies and gentlemen. If you've been practicing tax for a while, you know that there's always been this tension between residency system or a global tax system and source and a lot of what i'm hearing today and what we're seeing from BEPS is a greater emphasis on source taxation so where the key significant people functions are being performed so if you're practicing in a jurisdiction where it's a key significant people function and you are performing density functions your traditional business models and supply chains may be questioned by tax authority, so really something to think about. That brings us to our third polling question of the day. And again, we'd like your participation, so if we could get, please go to the next polling question. Um, so the question for you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we spoke about um, the custodian. Second question was identification. Now, for your most valuable intangible assets, how well has your company identified the group entity or entities that make significant economic contributions to the intangible assets and are they compensated appropriately for their contribution? So your response is no identification, analysis or review undertaken. Previous analysis does exist, but it isn't reviewed annually. Material economic contributions are reviewed regularly. We plan to review the re material economic contributions in the next 12 months, or we have a comprehensive and contemporaneous analysis. So if you don't mind voting and then comping, I want to 
bring this back to something that you touched on very early is Singapore is regarded as a regional hub, but it has historically had some of the lowest tax rates in Asia Pacific. How do you see Pillar 2 impacting Singapore as a potential intangibles holding location going forward? We have Kong Ping on the line. Has he dropped off? Okay, I think we may have lost Kong Ping. Um, so, so much for technology. So whilst uh, we look at that, let's consider the results um, of the session, so or the question. So uh, if we look at the results, we have 31% that's identified that we've had no identification, analysis or review. Uh, we have as low as only 11% um, that have comprehensive or contemporaneous analysis. So really interesting how low uh, the percentages of companies that have actually done uh, this analysis. So I just want to do a sound check very quickly. Kong Ping, are you back? I uh, just want to hear if, you can, if we can hear you. Kong Ping, okay. you are muted. Ah, are you back, Kong Ping? Ah, okay. So, Perry, I think let's uh, move on to the next slide, please. I think we may have lost Kong Ping. So much for the digital world and technology. Um, so I'd like to, just in the uh, 10 minutes that's left, we want to touch on two things. So I'm going to jump to um, our presenters. And um, June, I'll start with you. Uh, given the complex uh, and changing nature of intangibles, from your experience, briefly, what is best practice look like from a documentation and compliance perspective so one minute just give us an overview please sure maybe two points one is uh, a, a good balance between low, low low risk area and high risk area um, so i think uh, you know maybe probably the low, low risk area um, in terms of ip should be covered in a in a, in a more general type of uh, documentation but the high risk area um, should be I think focused and uh, treated with uh, better care in terms of uh, documentation. Um, and also, I think it, from a from a Japan perspective, uh, uh, the um, when 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 testing intangibles, um, cut analysis or cup analysis um, are actually quite difficult to be accepted by the Japanese tax authorities. Uh, the NTA requires a high level of um, uh, comparability, uh, for, especially for cup and cut analysis. Um, so, in such case, uh, you know, our recommendation is to prepare a secondary analysis or a or a, or a supplementary analysis uh, through, you know, possibly TNMM or or profit split that supports the uh, the cup analysis. So well, that will be the best practice uh, from a Japan perspective. Um, back to you, Jack. Thanks. Aaron, um, your uh, views on best practice from a documentation and compliance perspective, please. Uh, sure. Um, if, if I have to make a short and a concise uh, message to our audience, um, I want to say uh, if China is only one of your manufacturing base, uh, probably um, you, don't need to, you don't need to worry too much. Uh, but if China is your company's end market, you are selling products to this market or you are serving this market, I suggest a comprehensive discovery exercise. Um, the, the purpose of this um, is to uh, better understand um, what local contributions are being undertaken to your group's uh, global intangibles. And uh, this comprehensive uh, discovery exercise will help you gain certainty uh, or better clarity on whether uh, local intangible assets are created. Um, that, that's my uh, message to our audience. Uh, back to you, Jack. Great, thank you very much. So let's uh, see if the technology is going to uh, challenge us further. Kong Ping, uh, let's see if you're I back. I can hear you. 
Fantastic. Right. So, <laughs> any any views on uh, so Singapore uh, documentation and compliance perspective? Uh, anything from your perspective? And then if you have uh, a minute, so you can give us your view now on uh, pillar two from a Singapore perspective as well, please. Yeah. So so on the first point with regards to good uh, compliance, right, I think it's really to reiterate uh, the message that um, no amount of documentation is going to help if you don't have the right people in Singapore, right? So, so which means that the business strategy, your value chain and your transfer pricing, it all needs to be aligned if you want to achieve the desired results, you know, in Singapore. Yeah, and perhaps just a short spill on pillar two, uh, I think definitely uh, there will be a negative impact on tax incentives that are targeted at IP. Uh, whether these are enhanced deductions for R&D spend, uh, reduced tax rates for exploiting IP itself, or more generally, the reduced tax rates for operating a, a, a Singapore principle. I think what we do know uh, is that Singapore is studying the implementation of a domestic top-up tax. Uh, there is a lot that is happening behind the scenes, uh, but I guess we will get more clarity in a couple of months' time uh, during the budget announcement early next year. Uh, there is some expectation that in the short run, uh, Singapore will stand to get uh, some uh, some additional taxes if it introduces a minimum tax rate of 15% in Singapore uh, for the in-scope entities, uh, and that those revenues will be plowed back to benefit the overall economy. Uh, but there are really a lot of moving parts uh, to this calculus, uh, one of which is that you also need to worry about pillar one, where Singapore is expected to be a net paying jurisdiction. So if I was the Ministry of Finance, I'll need to know exactly what are the inflows as well as the outflows in order to decide uh, how much additional revenues, if, if any, uh, can be reinvested back into the economy. And I also need to do it smartly because uh, there are rules around providing benefits that are related to top up taxes. Uh, so and uh, to 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 I think what I would say is that uh, what we're seeing in the market right now is that MNEs that are investing in Singapore, they are still thinking about and applying for tax incentives. Uh, they're not waiting around for the dust to settle. And I think this is a smart strategy uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first is that you engage the incentive approving authorities early and you can obtain benefits in the near term. But perhaps more importantly, you know, in a couple of years down the road, uh, they are really setting themselves up for future negotiations with the same authorities for alternative uh, benefits should pillar to uh, kick in. Yeah. Right, Aaron. Uh, sorry, Kongping. Thanks very much. I'm glad you're back. So, um, very important in what I'm hearing is that um, I, the traditional transfer pricing documentation when it comes to intangibles may not be sufficient. I had an um, tax authority person make the following observation to me recently he said when i look at general transfer pricing reports companies have three or four pages on the industry analysis they'll have five or ten pages on their uh, benchmarking and then they have a half a page on the intangibles um, now if we think about what i said at the opening session about 84 percent of the value of the s p 500 driven by intangibles then i guess we are being challenged to rethink uh, how we do our transfer pricing documentation and where we're putting the emphasis. Um, if we have a, um, you know, 10 pages on services, but the value proposition around intangibles may be 10 times more, are we analyzing that correctly? And therefore, enhanced TP documentation may be required going forward. Now, um, we've come to the biggest part of the Asia Pacific landscape. I'd like to close. Um, with two slides. So if I may please ask Perry to move on to slide 17. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, what did we try and do today? We tried to show you that we're living in a dynamic landscape and that intangibles in Asia Pacific play a key part of the economy. And we took you on a journey to hear from three of our most uh, or biggest economic contributors across the region around what is happening from their perspective, what are the tax authorities looking at, and, and then we try to show you why is this important from a tax technical perspective. In closing, 
our message to you is that intangibles touch every part of your company supply chain. And this is just an example of uh, one of our methodologies from an IP advisory perspective that we look at. And if you look at this, in today's world, intangibles, in the broader definition, touch just about every part of your business's DNA. So what this requires is for tax teams and businesses to take a holistic view of your intangibles. We asked the question around who is the custodian. And some of you that may have attended TP Minds would have heard me say this before. Transfer pricing practitioners in general, in my view, are best placed to be custodians of the intangibles because the broadened definition is a transfer pricing definition. We focus on functions, assets, and risks of the business. And therefore, we understand it in a broader context. It's critical to work with the finance team, with the governance team, the risk team, and your legal team. But transfer pricing, in my uh, humble opinion, sits at the core of intangibles. Um, if we could move to the last, last slide, please. So, apologies. Um, this is an interesting road ahead of us, and it is a road with a lot of um, challenges. But if you follow a methodical approach, you can unwind this complex world of intangibles and make it simple. So we've come to the end of our discussion today. I would like to take the opportunity to thank our presenters, June, Kongping, and Aaron. Thank you and special thanks to all of you who are able to join us today. We'd like to encourage you to fill out the short survey that will pop up on your screen momentarily and tell us what you think about today's program. If you joined us late, please note that this presentation will be archived for future viewing. If you feel that others would benefit from this webcast, please share the webcast via the share this icon or have them visit the debriefs website. We will respond to all the questions submitted during the webcast in a couple of weeks. And also, if you think of any other questions or comments later, please feel free to reach out to either myself or any of our speakers. We'd be more than happy to talk to you. And please don't forget to tune in to our next scheduled webcast from the Global Mobility, Talent and Rewards team on the 27th of October, titled Asia Pacific Employment, Tax and Immigration Updates. At last, from all of us at Deloitte, thank you for your participation to Deloitte's Asia Pacific Tax webcast today. Goodbye.